Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 572. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and having reconciled myself with time and space, I can tell you it's Friday, the 7th of February, 2020. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me clear my throat a little. <clears throat> Perfect timing for a cough to come on. Uh, love that you guys watch the show. Welcome to another show. And we need you to do some things to help this show become more popular. I think our audience has grown about 30% since last year, and that means uh, a lot of the new people have not heard a lot of the old stories. So uh, as we talk about stories, we may take more time introducing the story and giving a little background for stories. You just have to get used to that while we bring more of the audience on to what's happening. You as an audience member need to help us, and you can do that by liking the show. It's probably the most important part is to let Facebook and YouTube know that you like it. You click that little like button. <clears throat> Not sure why I'm... Hold on. I know why. <laughs> Gavin, show them how you make your coffee. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. You know, you need, this is what they need to know. In England, they pounce the, and, and churn their coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, we in America, you, we drive through. We drive, drive through for a coffee. <clears throat> That's better. Okay. So what we need you to do, obviously, like, we need you to share this program with your friends, relatives, people who you really love and people who you don't like that much. They need to know about Unscripted as well. If you've not subscribed yet, please subscribe. The most important thing that happens is in the comments. Every week I uh, upload this show and uh, George and Gavin and I are like, all done. Nope. Uh, 134 comments last week, uh, 200 the week before. You guys really like to keep the conversation going, and we like to participate in that. And we're going to talk a little bit about those comments today. Um, first, we need to talk uh, to Pete from North London. Uh, Gavin, got a comment we're going to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, Pete from North London, I, I have to apologize. Um, you are the man I thought you were. <laughs> Pete, Pete Broadbent. Um, whom I've known for some time a little bit, uh, I misrepresented on the show, and I'm very happy to apologize for misrepresenting him because, uh, but, but there was a reason for doing it. I, I, I had assumed that, that the Church of England Evangelical Council, having two bishops on its, on its um, membership, uh, and with bishops as, as wise and as well-informed and as politically astute, as the Bishop of Wilsdon, Pete Broadbent is and, and always has been, that, that he would obviously command an immediate audience and command immediate respect. And so when they asked him what he thought of something, he would tell them, and I, I, I assume they, they, they would listen because he's been around longer than anybody else and he, he, he knows how things work. So when I heard that the Church of England Evangelical Council were pursuing the third province as a way of trying to find a safe zone for the, the, the semi-Orthodox, I assumed it was Bishop Pete had, had told them that would work, and I was very surprised. And B Bishop Pete, Pete from North London, thank you very much. He got in touch with us and, and said I was completely wrong and I should have done more homework and I, I should have done. Uh, he has, in fact, told them that this would never work in a month of Sundays or a clutch of millennia. But this is a surprising bit. They haven't paid any attention to him. <laughs> and so, I mean, uh, and I, I, I found that inconceivable because. You know, within the church, you respect bishops both for their office, and as well, and if 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 as long with their office, they bring a degree of skill, uh, and um, uh, an experience. Then you then they're they're doubly to be listened to. So the idea that the CEEC doesn't listen to Bishop Broadbent is is lamentable. And I, if any of them are listening, I want to tell them from me: you should listen to Pete Broadbent. He really knows what he's talking about on many things. In my opinion, he's not sound on on women. It's true. Uh, and then the royal family, he's a bit iffy over. He's had his difficulties with them. But let's put that to one side. But in terms of church politics, he's the bee's knees. You should listen to him. He knows. Well, why can't the evangelicals get their act together, Gavin? I mean, how many types of them are? I mean, how many flavors are there that <laughs> you're unable to five, sort of meld one, them and to get into one, uh, one, one body, one form? 
Well, George, be careful because you tread you tread on my dreams here. I have I have bruises to show. Uh, certainly, when I was trying to engage myself in uh, restoring Orthodox Anglicanism, I think I could count at least five groups. There was the really excellent Free Church of England, led by John Fenwick, who's a man who's only ever gone up in my estimation and my affection. Uh, then you had. Um, you had ANIC, uh, the uh, American, the Anglican Church in North America, not in Canada, uh, who were really pushing women's ministry hard and quite determined that whatever solution the English wanted for themselves, they had to adopt the Canadian heterodox women's ministry position. And they were working through um, uh, they were working through Andy Lines and the Anglican Mission in England. So you had a hybrid situation, but they were. They were standing a bit behind him, so you couldn't quite see who was pulling the strings, but it became fairly obvious. And then, then you have dear Susie and Dan Leaf, who have left the Church of England, and they're also working either with or against Annick behind Andy Lyons, and you know, they're estimable and wonderful people. And then you have ACNA, and they said Andy going. Uh, they're also behind Andy Lyons, but they want something slightly different. Um, then you had the Ashenden lot. Um, so that was either five or six groups. And the question was, would anything other than the love of Jesus draw them together? And the answer was absolutely not. And so, and that was the ecclesial deficit that I was talking about. If um, Gavin, I'm reminded of the probably the most prescient movie of the 20th century, The Life of Brian, of the debate between the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front, that one are heretical splitters and uh, traitors to the cause, and yet at the same, the cause seems to be identical. Why? For someone of, of my ignorance, why can't they just get their act together? Is it purely personality, or there are deeply held? You mentioned a deeply held theological conviction. You described Anik as heterodox on women's orders. They would describe you uh, probably likewise on your submission to Rome. <laughs> is it is it just personalities, or is this? Uh, something that has been in the Church of England in its DNA, I guess going back to Newman and even earlier, of not being able to work uh, together. Well, George, let me fight back just for a second before I answer the question and, and say that, uh, that the position I've adopted is to choose the unbroken practice of the Church everywhere at all times for, first of all, the one and a half thousand years, and, and then um, East and West continue beyond that, when, when the Protestants decided that you could build a church based on your own personal reading of the scriptures. And that's produced a thousand denominations. A great deal of evangelism and a love of Jesus and a, and, and a deep understanding of the scriptures, all which is good. But the trouble is, I mean, in the end, you have to decide. And this is one of the very interesting questions we all have got to decide. Does my right and my opportunity to read the scriptures as I want to take precedence over building the church, the body of Christ. And if you say, yes, it does, then you have lots of enthused Christians bearing witness to Jesus, which is great, but you have a problem building the church. If you say no, then you get to build the church and you then have a problem to make sure you have lots of enthused Christians. And so these are the vices and virtues of Catholicism and Orthodoxy on one hand, and Protestantism on the other. So um, the the Anic people could never call me heterodox over everything, anything, because I've chosen the faith once the apostles has continued. Moving on, however, um, the the question then comes: as society develops and culture moves, to what extent do you preference culture over tradition and scripture? And this is this is where Protestantism has a lot of difficulty because you have you have as many positions as you can take as there are people. Uh, and if you then add into that the empire building mix, which is let's follow charismatic people with influence. Uh, I follow Peter, Kephas, Paul, Jesus, Apollos, exactly the same thing they had in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Then you have two overlapping sources of conflict. One, separate interpretations of scripture and, and then party politics. And the trouble is you need to have something as an antidote to both of those. Now, the Catholics and the Orthodox have it in terms of the magisterium. They say, what has the Holy Spirit taught us to do over the years? Let's do that. Um, that if you don't have that, you've got the kind of problem you have. Now, in, in, in North America, you can overcome that with, if the Lord sends you a vicious presiding bishop 
for the Episcopal Church and a very gifted, charismatic saint like Bob Duncan. And if those two things happen together, then you can just about find an antidote to uh, different interpretations of scripture and power politics. But they don't exist in England. So we have we have the People's Front of Judea, the Judeans People Front, and three other versions, and no way of reconciling them. And this is and this is tragic because you can't you can't build a church otherwise. So so the, the Anglicans in England have to find a way of building the church as well as what they've done already, which is finding a way of loving Jesus in their own idiosyncratic fashion. I think it's important to note that, you know, here in America we had the dragon. Uh, which arose out of the Episcopal Church, and we had uh, a Bishop Duncan who became the Dragon Slayer. But not only that, he had the ability to, uh, through his charism, uh, allow people to say, hey, I, wa I want that. I want to be part of that. And he took all those disassociated groups, almost a dozen of them, and uh, helped form the Anglican Church in North America. That is not something you guys have the ability to do, uh, at least we've seen this in the last 10 years, in England in any shape or form there's, well, there's what a we've deficit been talking. Of, you talk about it you meet about it but there's that deficit of having a one leader stand forward and say follow me or this is the way forward you have uh th probably three leaders uh who have just no authority and no charism uh say follow me and they're the good guys they're the, they're guys, the guys who are working outside the church of england because they've decided the church of england is going to fail the people inside the Church of England who, who should be following Pete, Bo Pete Broadbent but aren't have reached levels of, of, of supineness and incompetence that boggle my imagination. And I'm sorry to be rude. Uh, I exempt Pete Broadbent from this. Pete, Pete has kept to his principles. Um, they're not ones I agree with. And I've always wondered what his end game was. And, you know, I, I, maybe he'll come on the show and tell you because he's a very articulate very good man and a highly effective Anglican bishop. But he's working in a system that is falling to pieces, is covered in hypocrisy, is driven by some pretty, by, by some people whose understanding of the gospel is so far-fetched and so committed to the culture that I, I wonder what, what Pete and the Church of Even England's Evangelical Council think their end game is. If it's not the third province, uh, and that can't be done. You know, what is it? How how long? I mean, how long are they going to be able to live with the cunning plan that Archbishop Welby has cooked up, which is known by living in love and faith, which is about to break out and tell us what they really think, as if we didn't know it already. Even private eye are beginning to expose the tectonic plates of of saying one thing in public and doing another thing in private. Well, let's switch here. The, the Church of England's having their well, general council coming up, right? Let me. Okay, let me, you want to back up? I'd like to to raise. Uh, I don't share uh, some uh, many of the thing the the views Gavin has shared, though I he articulates them very well and strongly. And it, but it come, does come down to a different understanding of ecclesiology, which Gavin has uh, spoken about most eloquently in the past, and I. I am not reading the minds of the Church of England Evangelical Council leaders or Pete Broadbent. I'm just offering you what George thinks. Um, one of the people, one of the theologians, one of the scholars I've discovered is a Knox from Sydney, Australia. And I actually know his son, David, who is a priest in the Diocese of Central Florida. And Knox uh, was a wide-ranging scholar, evangelical scholar, but he did a lot of work in ecclesiology, and one of the issues he discussed when they put together, when the reformers in the Church of England put together the Articles of Religion, and they defined the church as the gathered assembly of people, visible assembly of men. What does that tell us? Where does the center of authority lie? In the Episcopal Church, we have the fight between is the set, the central institution. The national church in the form of a general convention, is it the diocese, is it the local congregation, is it the family? And Knox has really written strongly about the local congregation being that center of focus of the faith. Now, this is not a plea for congregationalism. Knox is an Episcopalian in the sense of understanding the role of bishops. But for me, I can uh, prosper and be very happy 
and in, and feel I'm doing the work of the Lord in an Episcopal church whose national church I disagree with on most every issue because my focus is on that gathered community of visible faithful believers around this this community. Now, again, this is not a uh, an ecclesiology that I, I'm not going to speak for you, Gavin, but I don't think this is your understanding. But I do think that we need to realize that there are multiple understandings that uh, may lie behind some of this inability to act, get everybody's act together. It, you know, on one level, yes, there's personal uh, pride and prejudices and animosities and this and that. But, but when we're getting down to that basic level of how does this all work, we don't agree. We agree about Jesus Christ. We agree about, you know, the virgin birth and the Trinity and the creeds. But then when we get into the definition of what is the church, we can both believe in the church, but when we are asked to describe what this church is, we have very different views. Well, now, I run into Anglican bishops who says, you know, sometimes I just wish we had a magisterium. I run into... Uh, we do say, have a magisterium, Kevin. It's called it's Anglican prayer Unscripted. Prayer. Yeah. That's oh, the no, magisterium. Geez, no. <laughs> well, that's, the best that's thing we have is a prayer job. book. I mean, that, that's, but, the, that's the sixth instrument of communion <laughs> at the Anglican communion. You know, the, the reality is there's people who... Um, in concept, want a magisterium. Somebody who's 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 the last guy at the chain. Who, who where does the buck stop here? Type person. My and, wife is the answer. Here. Yeah, yeah. And so they they've always looked for that. But then we have something like the, the story today is Pope Francis uh, has the uh, president of Argentina and his mistress over for a uh, a meet the, the the Pope day, and he serves them uh, communion. You know. My question is, well, then what good is the magisterium? So can I answer that? <laughs> you may as well go for it, Gavin. <laughs> well, ever, ever since you sent me that link, I've been, uh, uh, I, I, I've been thinking about it. And my wife said, don't answer the question. <laughs> don't answer the question. Duck the question. <laughs> Speak quickly in a low voice. She can't it's hear it. <laughs> um, I, so, so I mean, th George, thank you because you've you quite rightly given us, uh, and, and there, are, there are lots of people doing their theology through un Anglican Unscripted. We've discovered that people at different stages of the Christian life listen to us and help, and and, and are in conversation with us as we think out loud, um, and that's a great privilege. And so, um, we're not pushing our own particular viewpoints. But we're trying to explain how we got to them and what their virtues are. I, I think George has described very well a, 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 a vibrant form of Anglicanism, which is essentially congregational, living in an Episcopal framework, and, uh, and and the two sets of values inform each other with a with a fertile mutuality, and that's great. My problem is that that um, when times change, you may need something else, and so my reading of the of the the state of the times at the moment is that. The church is in a life or death struggle with a febrile, uh, with with a febrile secularism that is intent on destroying it, and will only be able to withstand it if it rediscovers a common corporate identity that is stronger than the one Anglicanism has allowed. And so, um, you're quite right in describing uh, the lack of virtue in the situation that that, that you that, that involves the Argentinian president and his mistress. And we could probably make a long list of all the things that the Catholic Church has done wrong. But 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 it's done them wrong. Although it's done them wrong, um, I still go back to this wonderful story I heard in the 1980s where uh, a fairly a little old lady became a Catholic just at the time when they were exposing the worst of Catholicism in a film about the Borgias. We've mentioned this about a month ago. Um, and And her argument was, any institution that can become so corrupt like that, but still produce the holiness that produces Mother Teresa of Calcutta and a thousand other unknown Mother Teresas must have something in it. And I, my, my view at the moment is that um, it's wonderful to have a church full of people who love Jesus and read the Bible. That is essential. But you also have to have a church that can hold together with a unified view on Christian ethics and presence. And the Orthodox and the Catholic Church do do that but Protestantism can't do it. And, and Protestantism has two flaws at the moment. One is that, it's, that the much of it's become liberal and it's died and evaporated. And that bitch that hasn't become liberal has become so schismatic that it can't act together. 
Now, there are times when you can have the luxury of that and you can survive those things. But I don't think in these times you can survive those two particular deficits. And so my, my, my vocation, my sense of calling, my, my discernment is I'll have to live with the contradictions of a church like Catholicism in order to get the blessing of the magisterium and the coherence in the face of this really powerful onslaught that Christendom I, faces. I'm not biting my bottom lip. I'm not trying to hold hold it in, but uh, did the Roman Catholic Church survive Vatican II? Vatican II. <laughs> Is it going to survive Vatican III? That, uh, that, well, that, that's such a, so at the moment, the place, the, 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 the cathedral where I go to, the, the, the dean stood up and said, we're going to rip out uh, all the changes we made after Vatican II in this cathedral, and we're going to go back to pre-Vatican II Catholic spirituality because it works. People are going to kneel and receive Jesus on the tongue. People are going to, uh, um, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to replace the transcendence that we've lost when we sold out to imminence. Now, this is another argument that we can have, but I think it's it's a realization that. In trying to marry Christianity with the culture that led to Vatican II, it didn't work. And there are lots of Catholics around the world who are reconsidering and saying, well, we tried it, and what did it do? Let's, let's move back within the barricades of what has been Christian culture that's worked for 2,000 years. Vatican II was a step too far. Well, Protestant culture has worked for very very long time 500 years 600 we wouldn't we would not have you know gavin uh, i don't want to be uh i don't want to uh repeat the uh the sociologist was it uh, weber the uh, whole modern world of economic and uh, wealth and prosperity and uh, liberal democracy is a direct result of the protestant uh, worldview as arose in england uh, it has nothing to do with authoritarianism. In my ch in my pa and here's my problem with Catholicism: it's the authoritarianism, for good or for ill. Um, in my parish, uh, and when I, I one, I have a very good memory, and I know the name of all six hundred people in my church. And so, as I give them communion, I say, "The body of Christ: Fred, Ethel, Bob, Jean." Some will hold out their hands, some will open their, and some will be standing, some will be kneeling, some will hold out their hands, some will open their mouths. We don't have a uniformity of how we receive the communion. Some were trained in a certain way, others have come to the faith lately, others have come, you know, from the Baptist tradition, and when they receive the communion, they just don't know any better, and they, you know, this is how they do it. Fighting over whether or not you stand or sit, kneel or cross yourself, I think it's ultimately a very sterile thing. Now, yes, we okay, can George, talk let, about let me, the let me ask you, of liturgy, but I don't. But I don't. But I don't think these. But, but see, these outward authoritarian thing that you must do it this way because Vatican II says no. We're going to go back to Vatican I the way we said it. What's George, the point? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to say if you go into one of your parishioners' houses and you see a Bible there. And, and, and on the Bible, there is, a, there is a hot coffee cup that has marked the cover and spilt over, and the Bible is now covered in coffee stains and coffee marks. And would, would, would you have any sense that you wanted to say to them, actually, this is, this is not the best way of treating the Word of God and the Scripture? It requires actually, a, Gavin, I would respect. be... Uh, Gavin, I would actually... I'm actually teaching a series from and in scripture, how it got. Here's a one. Uh, you can, can George, could you repeat that? You got cut off by the, the yeah, yeah. censor called the internet. I'm teaching a series on the canon of scripture, how we got to that, and why we understand and treat the Bible. We're, if I walk into a home and I see the Bible in a bookcase, pristine cover, I know that Bible's not open to read. If I see a Bible on a table with a coffee ring, with drips down the side, with ripped pages, with marks. I see a Bible that people are seeking to wrestle with and engage with. And for me, I would, and a Bible is a tool that needs to be used. It's not an icon which, which we worship. So I, I, so the, you actually teed it up rather nicely for me, Gavin. I would say <laughs> absolutely. I want to see a Bible with coffee stains and on the side table underneath uh, the, a, a, a can or whatever. 
because then okay. that is something that is active in the person's life and psyche. George, what you've done in, in a brilliant way and very, very cleverly is to take in the image that I teed up for you so beautifully, as you say, uh, and, and to put it in a context that then removes it from the point I was trying to make. Be beautifully done. But, but, but it wasn't the point I was trying to make. The, um, in, my, in my picture, the, the book is not studied. It's not used. It's, it's being abused because people don't understand uh, so you can have two kinds of Bible. Then. You're right. You've chosen to, to say, well, in my story, they're using it. That's why it's messy. And that's great because they're using it. And I would agree with you. Of course, I would. Uh, in the analogy I was trying to make, it's not being read. It's, it's being disregarded, disrespected, not read, not dealt with. Uh, and um, I remember... Uh, I, I remember once they having a conversation with, you know, to, to what extent do you actually treat the Bible itself physically with some level of affection? Um, and so you're, you're right, there's a strong Protestant anti-materialist uh, view that it doesn't matter, it's the contents that matter. Mm -hmm. But I think what I was trying to say was that it's it's not authoritarian. Kevin, go on. I hear, My I saw Bible <laughs> is three feet from me, but it's on the floor. What does that say? The dog's been it, it. means you, it means you haven't picked it up. <laughs> There's no dust to, on it. I, uh, I, uh, Gavin, I, I think we. I, I'm going to thread this needle for us right now. We've talked okay. in the past about using the cathedrals for profane uh, purposes. I yep. made the point that, well, the cathedral is secondary. You talked about the in, intrinsic holiness. Where we were on the same point was where you use something dedicated for God to a purpose that has nothing to do with God. Putting yeah. a, uh, what was the, not a whirly it's gig a or a, oh, that slide thing. What was they called it? Uh, 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 a, a, um, uh, it'll come back to me in a moment. With the, uh, the cathedral that put in that uh, indoor uh, amusement Nor Norwich arcade. Cathedral. Yeah, oh, the the uh, helter skelter. Rochester, helter skelter. Rochester that's skelter. right. That's yeah. Helter skelter. Now, I um, I think that's offensive because you're taking something that uh, is to be is a tool to use to bring people to a close relationship with Jesus Christ, and using it for non for entertainment purposes for. In, the, in other words, using it as Gavin is using the Bible as a doorstop or as a as a, a, as coaster, a uh, yeah. coaster. I agree entirely with you on that. Um, now, here's where we differ is that you have different views on the holiness of places than I do. And that may come, and you raise a point of the anti-materialist Protestant mindset. Um we're not going to solve that issue today, but, yeah. uh, uh, but I think we. But here's where we agree on that: is yeah. just how we get there. Is each. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're different parts of our journeys. I do want to cover a little bit of the news here, gentlemen, and not just uh, spend uh, the last <clears throat> twelve minutes. And the audience loves it too, discussing differences of uh, denominations. Let's talk a little bit about what's going to happen uh, this week with the Church of England uh, having their general synod. Uh, we posted a story, uh, a press release, by some victims. And I thought it was it, it's important that we, we discuss that. And uh, George, can you uh, lead into that story? Yes, a letter was uh, published. Uh, an open letter was published earlier this week to, uh, from victims of some of the high profile and other abusers unknown to me, where General Synod is going to have a motion uh, that will essentially kick things up to the bishops and uh, have lessons learned. All the cliches that they've done in the past are going to repeat in the future and basically not do anything. And the victims of these uh, predatory clergy have said, look, you really actually need to take concrete steps to do this and this. And they wrote this open letter. And two lay members of Synod put forward a motion to actually put into practice the things that... Uh, <laughs> Gosh, we do in the Episcopal Church and the ACNA right now. In other words, this is not; these aren't crazy things that they're asking for. They're standard things in other churches around the world that have dealt with clergy abuse. And the uh, General Synod uh, Committee responsible for receiving motions ruled this out of order, and so they're going to have another debate on safeguarding, where you're going to have more bleeding, bleating as sheep do about we will learn lessons. We promise to spend lots more money on staffers, but ignore victims, 
and basically hope everybody eventually dies or goes away so we can get back to business as usual. I'm being but that, cynical, but that's how it comes across to me. But that's the point. The church, the Roman Catholic, Anglican, Episcopal, Methodist, on down the line, has nailed safeguarding. They know how to protect the children ongoing from here in the future. They, they, they know how to, to, to search for predators, make sure they don't show up in Sunday school. They, they, they've nailed that. They don't know how to apologize for the past. They don't know how well, to I make the one... past right. They don't know how to, to redeem this at it any way, shape, or form. Well, I see, the Church of England most... is so... Uh, go yep. ahead, Kevin, I'm sorry. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> your bell, your speech. I, <laughs> yes, I, right. I, I, found, I found one of the most moving parts of this open letter, uh, which was extremely well constructed, to be the bit, you tell us that you don't have enough money to help us rebuild our lives, which have been severely impaired by the abuse um, the extent of the impairment is not for us on the outside to know, but it's it's one can well, well imagine that some people have taken some pretty awful hits that have made it difficult to function. And they said, we come to you asking for occasional bits of money to mend our lives, and you say, we don't have any. How is it you've just spent £21 million on the library at Lambeth Palace? And, and I, I, I think that's an immensely good question. The, the church commissioners have enormous sums of money. It's, a, it's true um, that they, the ways in which they can use them have been circumscribed. One of the cleverer things that Archbishop Welby has done is to get them to change the rules to allow him to dip into the Church Commissioner's funds for some of his special projects. I, I, I hope that, that £21 million for his library isn't one of his projects, uh, and I expect it isn't, but nonetheless, you can understand people saying, we don't get justice from you, we don't get sympathy from you, we don't get understanding from you, and from the richest, one of the richest organizations in the country, we ask you for some practical help, which you can, you can find £21 million for an upgrade for a library, but you can't find any to make reparation for us. I think they have a very good point, and I, and I, I think the Church of England should be ashamed of itself. And Justin Welby can go to Amritsar and apologize profoundly, personally, uh, for a massacre that occurred a hundred years ago during the Raj, committed by uh, uh, Gurkha troops with British officers against Sikhs. Nothing to do with the Church of England, other than that that's, they were, it's the British Empire, yet he cannot meet with the victims of abuse. He cannot, and the Church will not pay for their counseling, for their rehabilitation. The church is going to invest $21 million in a grotesquely ugly building. It looks like a car park The uh, that you see. In, well, this, my post-war British architecture is some of the worst in the world. And this is mm -hmm. sort of the Corvassier brutalist concrete ugliness uh, well, going to I be think... grafted onto Lambeth Palace. $21 million for an eyesore that's going to fall down in 50 years. And instead of uh, putting it into the people whom the church has destroyed. Well, this is what the Roman Catholic Church was going through in the 1980s. This is the exact setup that the Church of England finds itself in. The church Here in America, the Roman Catholic Church said, if we pay one victim, we're going to have to pay them all. How do we protect our diocese from you know, funding out millions and millions of dollars? Because every diocese has predators, every diocese has this problem, and this is going to just wipe us out. We well, you commit one. bankruptcy. You, can, you, yeah. you file for you bankruptcy, can, and you right. have... A, uh, you have someone dole out the assets appropriately. Right, that's what you should do. And so, so the, one person does anything, but here right. are the assets that are available to allow the church to continue as institution, mm -hmm. but here's the money, and they, a third party uh, will adjudicate and uh, the claims and distribute uh, reparations, or, uh, will take care of redress. But and the, here's, the, here's the thing, the Church of England will not allow itself to be judged by any outside authority, be it the law, be it independent bodies, be it the victims. It has set itself, <clears throat> itself as its own. The insurance company that has uh, basically advised the church to play hardball with the victims has bishops and senior clergy on its board of directors. It's an incestuous, I don't want to say criminal because it's not legally criminal, but morally reprehensible way of dealing with this. And they won't deal with it until they f they deal with the first one. 
Yes, you're going to have to pay them all. You're going to have to make reparations for them all. But start. The Roman Catholic Church started. Uh, the diocese here in Pennsylvania finally forked out, you know, 120 million dollars. You know, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know who it was who, who who wrote the letter. I imagine one or two people, but it was <clears throat> exceptionally well written, and and, the, and it was signed not by the names of the victims, it was signed by the names of the predators. In other words, we in the name are of the, the victims. Predators. In the name of, of the predators, these. we are the victims of, of of these predators. Here are the predators that you are responsible for. And when you read the list, and I'm afraid it it, it goes right up to Jonathan Fletcher. Uh, and and it, it has a couple of asterisks, case, cases ongoing, and one very moving asterisk where it said the victim doesn't want to, to name the predator. Uh, that's not part of what this victim is doing. But I'm I'm uh, I'm afraid it it, it was a it was an act, it was a, a serious challenge to the integrity of the Church of England, and I felt very strongly indeed when they said we, you know, we've come to you asking for the very least understanding, and we have the sense that you're simply running this. By, by a small cabal of people interested in power, and as George said, unwilling to be accountable for the sins of the organisation, are hiding behind lawyers and insurance companies. Uh, you, you would, you know, and the, the problem is that the rhetoric of the archbishops and the public bishops is so far removed from this brutality that it's a gap that can't be sustained and continue to claim an attempt of Christian integrity. The gap's too large. The, Matt, I'd like to jump to another topic if we're limited for time, but it flows from this. It's the question of hypocrisy. Um, oh, you, you don't want to cover Green Lent? Green <laughs> No, let's okay. do hypocrisy. Let's now. roll our eyes, and there we've covered Green Lent. <laughs> you got it. We got it. <laughs> private Eye. Gavin, tell us, about, tell us about Private Eye as an institution in British life. What is Private Eye? Uh, private Eye is a satirical magazine uh, which has which grew up in the late 1960s, uh, and it is set out to expose the truth about people's and, and organizations' actions, uh, and um, alongside some very funny cartoons. Uh, it is always set out to hold the powerful to account, uh, governments and, and large organizations, and when it's got its teeth into hypocrisy, it often won't let go. It's been nearly bankrupted many times by being sued by clever lawyers for libel, but it still survives. And every so often, George, it turns its attention to the Church of England. The And in today's Friday, it came out yesterday, but the publication date of today has an article about the Bishop of Birmingham, and the Bishop of Birmingham, David Urquhart, Urquhart. And they accuse him of hypocrisy on the safeguarding issue and hypocrisy on the moral, uh, on his personal lifestyle. The uh, article, uh, Bishop Urquhart is one of the 60s, 70s, one of the oldest bishops, most senior bishops in the Church of England. And when the Bishop of Lincoln was suspended by the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, because Urquhart is one of the senior bishops, he had to give his approval for the suspension. And Private Eye has a lovely little article, being sarcastic, saying, isn't this rather funny? Ha, ha, ha. Uh, because Urquhart has massive safeguarding failings in his own diocese, yet he's being placed as judge over Bishop uh, uh, Lawson of Lawson. Lincoln. And then it goes on to say, and I'm going to read this paragraph uh, to you, all this does not inspire confidence the bishop or his about uh, Bishop of Birmingham or his judgment, and there are those in his diocese who question his unusual domestic arrangements. So, after three columns uh, pillaring him for his hypocrisy over doing nothing, we now have the, the bishop shares his official abode with a twenty-something Indian restaurant manager. On the top floor, of the bishop's croft, the vast neoclassical bachelor pad he occupies in Birmingham. Today they have, together they have traveled the world and take regular private retreats in the bishop's native Scotland. Urquhart's care for the young man is so solicitous. Well, uh, you, I thought we were going to name a female. No, no, Urquhart's care for this young man is so solicitous, he penned a poem describing that they are bound for endless love, quote unquote, which he has published on social media. The 67-year-old cleric has even a dose promotional Facebook video for his housemate's new restaurant in Sully Hall. 
As a leader of the Lord's spiritual, Urquhart joined the majority of prelates in voting against same-sex marriage, though he did refuse to support Muslim parents protesting against same-sex relationships at the Parkfield Community School. Now, they have just outed the Bishop of Birmingham. Uh, private eyes out of the Bishop of Birmingham for being a hypocrite. He votes against same-sex marriage, yet it is alleged or alluded to, or they walk a very fine line here saying that uh, this man's living with this 20-odd-year-old boyfriend in his bachelor's pad. Now, I, think I, ha we could, I have to... Uh, we, we do need to say, because I've, I've hit the hammer and I need to give the quick response. We contacted the Diocese of Birmingham. We contacted the Church of England. The Bishop of Birmingham's uh, assistant sent me a statement about an hour ago saying there is no truth whatsoever in these allegations about his household and that they will seek legal advice. And as to the safeguarding things, we had a paragraph of all the blather about lessons learned, safeguarding, Church of England is there for everybody. So they didn't really say anything about safeguarding other than let's just hope this all goes away. But he denies completely the allegation that he's a hypocrite of preaching Christian morality from the pulpit, but living a non-Christian private life. Well, Gavin, private eye didn't wake up and just have a, a revelation. Oh, let's go investigate this bishop. The left is starting to out the left again. And Yes, but, but you see, uh, Urquhart is not... I mean, the reason I think Urquhart can do this is because um, that is the climate that Justin Welby has, has affirmed. Uh, as as part of his tenure as Archbishop of Canterbury. So he's appointed two bishops, um, the Bishop of Sherburne, who, who lives uh, in discreet domestic bliss with another lady, and the Bishop of Grantham, who lives in public domestic bliss um, with his chaste companion. Uh, and, and what they say is uh, it's perfectly acceptable to have a, a lifelong partner, as long as you don't sleep with them, and we will ask you whether you sleep with them uh, or not. And if you give us the well, answer, we expect... The more specific, genital sexual relations. You more can sleep with them so long as you... Well, yeah, but they can uh, only be a same-sex partner. They would not allow this of a heterosexual relationship. You could not have a mistress who you're not having uh, genital sexual relationships with living in your uh, bishop's uh, abode. Well, I don't think I can speak on behalf of the Church of England at that point, Kevin. But at the, but at the moment, let's just deal with the same-sex stuff because that's where that's where the political and, and ethical developments are. Uh, and and what we're limbering up for is a, a climate where pastorally, in humane terms, this is accepted. Uh, because what the Church of England is brought into is uh, if you want to express sexual and amorous, well, amorous love, not sexual yet. If you want to express romantic love for somebody, you can. You just can't make it sexual outside marriage. But but it but what is the what is the uh, conciliar development that living in love and faith is going to do? Do we think it's going to row back from that or is it going to move forward? Of course it's going to move forward. And it's going to move forward based on the examples that the church is willing to live with at the moment without any criticism. I think Urquhart probably banked on the fact that if his life could remain marginally discreet for a little bit longer, it would soon have a pastoral stamp of approval as the church ex takes the next step in its examination of the way in which it prioritizes romance and sex over holiness and discipleship. Well, that's what the issue is. Part of, part of the issue is last week, uh, one of the leader, uh, ja Jane Ozan, uh, public on I think it was on Twitter or Facebook, said that the left really needs... To, Activists really need to start to out these bishops who they know are to be partnered in partner <coughs> relationships already in, against changing. So a week later, after we have a it's probably maybe a coincidence, most things in life are, we have a bishop outed. Now about, I think it was like 10 years ago, Peter Tatchell, the gay activist, outed uh, half a dozen uh, gay bishops. And at the time, the press was n did not run with this. They did not really trumpet this. And it just sort of died away, and one or two discreet discreetly retired, and the others just carried on. Here, as I'm looking on Facebook and reading some of the uh, comments by gay activists, they're not willing 
or some of the more vocal ones are not willing to let keep the keep the keep the status quo. So unless Bishop Urquhart comes on side and becomes a public advocate for same-sex relationships, they're going to out him. Well, now, there, we, we posted a story last week of a uh, lesbian bishop who said she is not going to be an advocate. Yeah, Sherry Van is the new Bishop of Monmouth. Uh, when she was elected uh, Bishop of Monmouth, uh, we uh, ran it. Uh, I, I, I had been told by people who served with her on the Archbishop's Council that she was a partner lesbian, a woman in a civil partnership. And I contacted the church in Wales, and they had no comment. Now, this past week, she's on BBC Wales saying that, uh, yes, I'm partnered, but and I'm gay, but I'm not going to be an advocate for same-sex marriage in the church. I'm a bishop on more than just one issue. Now, the gay activists are furious that one of their own is open about being gay, but is not going to t pick up their standard. So there's really a, a, the temperature is rising in the political sphere of the bishops who've been able to sort of cut it both ways. Uh, we've had stories in the past where we were given a photo of, of two bishops, one with his hand on another bishop's bottom, an assembly of men that was rather risque at best. Um, we did not the and the Church of England. We did not the uh, we did not eat. That's not. We don't go that direction. But uh, I think these things are going to come st start coming out, especially if we have bishops who are more conservative. Gavin has you know spoken of bishops of whom he knows who uh, live a uh, an unchaste lifestyle that's known to the to their community and to the people around them. And I don't think this is going to be kept secret much longer, if given the the heat that is surrounding the debate over human sexuality. Am I the mistaken, border, Gavin, or is English hypocrisy going to win out in the end? <laughs> There's no limits to the to, to the ambitions of English hypocrisy. Mm. Um, but I think the reason it won't happen, George, is that that's what I think living in love and faith is designed to act as uh, an insurance policy against the charge of hypocrisy. It will usher in a new culture. Where, um, where, where, in inverted commas, faithful and, and stable relationships are the gold standard for Christian ethics. It doesn't matter what uh, flavor they are in terms of orientation, so long as they're sincere and stable. Um, and, and, you know, that has nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with Bible, nothing to do with holiness, but everything to do with what our local culture chooses. Um, to today, we had a rather... Um, a rather uh, handsome BBC presenter um, come out and say that at the age of 58 with a wife and two children, uh, he's discovered he's gay and everyone wept over him as if he had done one of the bravest things imaginably possible. And he says, I knew I can now live with myself, despite the fact he's discarding his wife and, 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 and two daughters. But we have in our culture some um, some extraordinary value that, that that to be gay is somehow to have reached the heights of of courageous exploration of one's humanity um and and the idea that this attracts virtuous comment from all commentators irrespective of the damage that it's done to people you have commitments to that's something that is going to be reflected and is being reflected by the church and it's so sub-christian that one of the things we're doing is not being puritanical uh, or spoil sport, uh, or unkind. We recognize we all have flaws, all struggle with temptation. What we object to is a perversion of the Christian message, which is meant to save people and to bring them on a trajectory of holiness, not on a trajectory of dissolution and perversion. Can I right. just jump in, Kevin? Uh, Kevin, go, go. Kevin, do you remember we had that <laughs> governor of New Jersey who was married with children who sure. got, and got, he did the exact same thing. Uh, came out as gay in his uh, early 50s and mid 50s. And then what did he do? He announced he was going to become an Episcopal priest. <laughs> <laughs> it's a and natural to, transition, isn't and it? He went to General <laughs> Seminary, New York City. Uh, but I don't think they ever, not even the Diocese of Newark would ordain this guy because uh, maybe he had other skeletons in the past, but. 
Oh, man. So at least the Episcopal Church can claim to be a trailblazer of taking these late-blooming gay men and turning them into clergy. Oh, goodness. Well, we're at, uh, like, uh, what, 50 minutes, and this is where the, the, the audience fight happens, because I complain that we went long, and half our audience says, no, no, keep going. And then there's the people who can't go past 10 minutes. So I'm sorry, we're at 50 minutes. I need to wrap it up here. As we wrap it up, one of the biggest comments we read this week was people asking what we read and who our favorite theologians are. We went through the list of theologians last week uh, briefly. I forgot a couple. George, you had some more you wanted to mention. Let's do uh, two more. And then uh, next week, we'll. why don't we introduce our favorite books? So... Uh, oh. I'm going to slightly steal your question and turn it into my, a different direction. Sure. A uh, number of people mentioned John Henry Newman, and mm -hmm. a number of commentators uh, remarked on the uh, similarity between the trajectory in Gavin's life and Newman's life. Evangelical university lecturer who had a conversion to Catholic. Well, I'll let you finish the story. Gavin, is that a fair analogy? I mean, are, are the issues that Newman dealt with 150 years ago, 175 years ago, your issues, or are we diff talking different worlds, different different times? No, they are exactly the same. I, I'm hesitant to say so because it sounds very pretentious, um, and um, uh, I well, I could be so much more pretentious, but so but I won't be. Um, there were two members of the Anglo-Catholic revival, Newman and Pusey. Pusey thought that the Church of England could be brought back towards the gravitational um, safety of the magisterium. And Newman thought it couldn't. Uh, 150 years later, Newman's right. I think Pews is wrong. There are still people taking Pews's view in the Church of England. I took Newman's, and I'm following the trail that he blazed. But I, and I think in response to Kevin's question, I would say that two of the people I'd want to add, and I hope we might get a chance to talk about, uh, are Newman and Chesterton. Um, and both both Newman and Chesterton started off as Anglicans and discovered not just the magisterium, but they, they discovered the gold they were looking for in Anglicanism in the Mother Church and, and wrote very movingly about it. Any, uh, why don't we show up next week also with a, uh, a, a book? People ask what we read. So let's, uh, let's bring that next week to you. Um, please, please, people, go to the comments, add your comments. Why don't you add your favorite book and your favorite theologians as well, and we'll uh, hopefully... Uh, Tell you get... why you're wrong. And then... <laughs> <laughs> no, George. <laughs> That's not how it works. And then uh, next week, uh, uh, Gavin got an interesting le letter from one of our readers, and I kind of want to, without mentioning who it is, uh, give a brief synopsis of what they said. And it's, it's kind so of cool. This is because... Paul from North London, not Pete from North London. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's not Pete. It's not Pete. Pete no. <laughs> but it's interesting the, the experience that our viewers are having watching the show and uh, how it's part of their faith journey. And we really appreciate that. And uh, we are dumbfounded of how it happens, but God can use the three of us. He can use anybody. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 572 of Anglican Unscripted on Friday the 7th of January 2020. God bless you and keep you until next time. <laughs>